he was very single-minded about wanting to make movies. I mean, he told me he decided to make films when he was eight. I mean, I, I didn't know him then, but he said something when he was eight years old, he wanted to make movies. I mean, it sounds crazy, but I mean, he could have been like the English Spielberg. I mean, he had that kind of, he understood the vocabulary of film so well. We all grew up together very quickly, but he grew quicker. And he always, he, he, he would be quicker today. That's it. That's just who he was. And, uh, and I miss him. I miss him desperately. When Michael Reeves died at the age of 24, he'd already completed three full-length films and was on the verge of a major breakthrough. In 1960s Britain, he was almost unique. A young filmmaker with an innate commercial sense and the ability, like Hitchcock, to imbue his projects with a dark and personal vision. Reeves began making movies as a schoolboy in the late 1950s and even then was intensely serious about it. He didn't just want to make films, he wanted to make Hollywood movies, so we had to, we had to be able to track and things like that. It wasn't just point the camera. And we had uh, his mum's tea trolley with a little 8mm Bolex on top on a tripod. He got me to do the camera and do the lighting. So we had to practice tracking and focus pulling and all this sort of lark on eight little eight millimeter, <laughs> on eight millimeter films. And, and that was Ian Ogilvy's first movie. I met Mike Reeves, I think I was about 15. We were both about 15. We weren't at school together, but we had a mutual friend. And he said, I know this guy wants to be a director and you want to be an actor. Why don't you two meet? He wrote the script. I played the villain, he played the hero. It's called Carrion. It was a sort of um, innocent girl in wheelchair escaped psychotic prisoner invades her house boyfriend eventually comes around and rescues her film it's about 20 minutes i suppose he was somebody who was obsessed by movies by film and he remained so all his life and he would analyze movies he didn't just see films and say well that was a good movie he would you know he would try and work out where the camera had gone you know how the director had produced the effect he had he and his mother were the poor relations of a kind of rich family and when Mike was about 15, something happened. A trust was broken or something happened. And they suddenly, he and his mother suddenly became quite rich. Reeves' money gave him the freedom to pursue his ambitions. The first step on the road was a trip to Hollywood, where he sought out his idol, the action filmmaker Don Siegel. His great hero was Don Siegel, the American director. He took himself off to Hollywood at the age of about 17 and found out where Don Siegel lived and went and knocked on his door. And Siegel answered the door in a, in a, in a vest and a pair of underpants, as far as I, the story goes. He says, what do you want? And he says, I've come all the way from England to see you, Mr. Siegel, because you are the greatest film director in the world. Well, that's irresistible, isn't it? And um, um, Siegel invited him in and put him to work, and that's really how he became a, a junior. He, I think he started as a runner and then graduated up, and he started working for other people um, uh, as an assistant director. Using his connection with Siegel, Reeves was able to persuade producer Irving Allen to give him a job on the Richard Widmark film, The Long Ships, on location in Yugoslavia. Michael's family knew Irving Allen, uh, who was the producer. And I was down there in Yugoslavia, and Michael came along, and he didn't last very long. He was there probably three or four weeks of pre-production, and as I recall, maybe four or five weeks of production. He was pretty pleased to uh, got that close. Well, he was right in there, you know, right in actually making movies. Maslansky was so impressed with Reeves that he got him a job as second unit director on the 1964 production Castle of the Living Dead. He used to sleep in late. So I have to get to his room and bang on the door. But he, he was, uh, he took care of business, then he took off. I mean, I was really pissed off when he took off. I didn't understand it. I thought everything was going great. And it was, but he, it was something about, again, a, a girl. Michael couldn't have been older than what, 18 then, 17 or 18? So the next thing I do, I, I, I get a phone call from him. He said, look, I've got a script, <laughs> Revenge of the Blood Beast. Uh, I want to make a horror picture. I've got 15,000 pounds. And I'm, I'd like you to produce it and come to Rome. I'm coming to Rome, da, da, da. And he comes to Rome, and we made the picture. Mm -hmm. 
Reeves' film was called She Beast in America and Revenge of the Blood Beast in the UK. It was the story of a honeymooning couple lost in Transylvania who come up against the spirit of a vengeful witch. I was involved in a, in a little um, hamburger rib joint uh, in, in Rome called the Cowboy. And at that time it was possible if you had enough money to take yourself over to Rome there was so much going on, and talk yourself into doing a movie. When I met Michael Reeves, uh, he was doing uh, Revenge of the Blood Beast, and I was just as fascinated by him as I think probably everybody has been. To me, he was the, the young Orson Welles of, of our generation. I mean, his, his love and affection and knowledge and, uh, and effervescence about film was, was really greatly inspiring, I think, to all of us. Uh, we also, you know, why not? Why not? Let's go do it, which is exactly what he did in Revenge of the Blood Beast. And one day my agent called me and she said, have you ever heard of anybody called Mike Reeves? And I said, yes, good heavens, yes. So she said, he's offering you a film, which is the first film I'd ever made. And it was the lead. <laughs> this place is beginning to make me feel like a fugitive from the last weekend. Me too. I already see red stars before my eyes. Anyway, let's get on down to what this is. Oh, next. yes. What a strange place. It's all so full of weirdism and werewolves. Terrible line, darling. Great alliteration, but terrible line. In order to sell the picture, I needed a name. And in Ogilvy wasn't a name at the time. John Carlson, Mel Wells wasn't. So I had Barbara Steele, and I negotiated with David Niven, Jr. for I'd pay Barbara $1,000 plus commission, and she would work one day. I was a very clever producer in those days, and I didn't specify the number of hours that, that, <laughs> that she'd work. And of course, there was no great union there, and Barbara wasn't SAG. And next thing you know, I worked her 18 hours straight, and she has not t didn't talk to me for 20-some-odd years. What did I tell you? Uh, excuse me, but I uh, believe you've dropped your garlic. My what? Garlic, did you say? Indeed, yes. I remember the man who played the witch in it, the ancient, disfigured, horrible witch in it. And I remember it, during the lunch break, he used to go out into the roadway, which led, the main road that led to Rome, and he would try and hitch a lift from people, which caused a lot of skid marks all over the road. I think Michael's intent all the time was to make a horror picture that was scary. Oh, this day, be ye with your descendants, cause until eternity, think not that ye are rid of me, but I, Vardella, will return. Vardella will return. The fight is... I think when we saw what we were doing, and all the actors who were very intelligent people, were all pretty bright people, we saw what we were doing, that it wasn't quite that scary. So we might as well play it for a little bit of camp. And we did. Just a moment, sir. But I believe you have uh, my mother there. Impossible. Just let me see, please. Yes, that's her, poor dear. Into the wagon! Return, return, thou creature from the very depth of evil. Return to hideous mortality. never forget that, that great uh, scene where uh, somebody is w wielding a sickle. And it, it goes out of frame and they cut and it, it lands in a pile of hay on top of a hammer, you know, with a, a hammer and say, wait a minute, where did that come from? He did it in one take and he threw the sickle. He said, if this doesn't work once, we're not going to bother with it. It's just an idea. So there's a hammer lying on the floor, and he threw the sickle, and it landed perfectly, and that's why it's in the film.
This is the 60th anniversary of my first job, actually. Uh, I was Baby Bo Wilkes and Gone with the Wind. Patrick Curtis came to see me with a package with a director, Michael Reeves, executive producer himself, along with myself, Boris Karloff, and, uh, and Catherine Lacey as the two main leads, and Ian Ogilvy. The Sorcerers is about um, a pair of elderly scientists who um, invent a machine that enables them to share the experiences of a much younger man. This being a Michael Reeves movie, the experiences they share are those of Ian Ogilvy. Eagle to the blue leader. Relax. Try to clear your mind, empty your mind of all thought. Boy, you're coming on strong now. On a film like this, everybody pitches in and does whatever. So I was, I was lying on my back on the floor filming the kids on the dance floor dancing. And this is right at the height of the, the miniskirt era. So the skirts were really quite short. Fortunately, I think they had matching knickers. But <laughs> anyway, and I'm, I'm looking through the viewfinder, and, and I see the, the incredible face of my wife looking down at me going, what are you doing? Again, it was made on, uh, in a hurry, this movie, but it was, like all my Reeves movie films, were made quickly and very efficiently. I mean, we blew up a Jaguar car once on an old building site somewhere in Notting Hill, I think, without permission. I remember it like it was yesterday, sitting, well, we could, if we put maybe 10 gallons worth of petrol at the bottom of this pit, and when the Jaguar goes over the cliff and it hits the bottom, we can explode the 10 gallons, and it was, well, if 10 gallons good, 50 will be even better. And it blew the hell out of all of us. It shattered windows for blocks around. Our concern was that if we didn't get, sh get the shot and didn't get it finished, within minutes, the, the police would arrive and we'd all be in jail, for sure. And so we left this burning Jaguar at the bottom of the, this pit and, and we all took off for nine different directions, figuring, well, they'll catch one of us, but we'll all keep our mouths shut. <laughs> okay, love? Okay. Right. Let's go. And we did very dangerous things. I mean, I was driving this motorcycle down the M4 at about 100 miles an hour with no helmet, no protection of any kind, with Mike Reeves in the trunk of a car. Come closer, he'd say, and I was only about inches away from the back of this car. It was tricky, but it was dangerous, but it was fun. We were all kids, it was good. Mike, slow down! Michael! The films are a film almost existential in their deadness and their alienation at the soul of them, that, that something almost like a Cliff Richard musical at times in The Sorcerers, in these nightclub scenes where they're all drinking Coca-Cola and jiggling. How long do you think all this can last? You know, you feel that, that Jack the Ripper is sitting in the corner and is ready to let loose at any moment. <laughs> Witchfinder General, Reeves' next film, was his most ambitious to date. It told the controversial and blood-drenched story of a sadistic witch hunter in 17th century England. Witchfinder General came about because um, I received a galley proof and I read it. And I couldn't help but like it. I was wondering about film, the size of the budget, you know, how it goes. And I thought, well, the only person to do this is Michael Reeves. He produced the book and said, I want a, I want a movie out of this to Mike and said, I think this, this is a good, you know, we can make a movie out of this. I mean, that was Tony's enthusiasm, blood and gore and bloody blah, blah, blah. And Mike, you know, what he liked was the possibility of making a film. It was right up his street, mm -hmm. that kind of film, you know. It has some scope to it, it has some breadth to it. There was some canvas to this film. I think that's what struck us, as the possibility to make a film partly to do with English landscape, but also to do with movement. 
through the geography of England and the landscape? Tony said yes, but it's too expensive. We would have to have another partner in on this. And that's how AIP, American International Pictures, got uh, involved with it. And that's how Vincent Price got involved with it. This man accuses you, Sarah Lowe's, and you, Richard Marshall, of consorting with the devil. Is that not so, Mr. Webb? It is that, sir. Well, I said to Michael, I said, you must go and meet him. He said, I haven't time. You're the producer. You go and meet him. So I drove out in a limo and waited at the foot of the escalator for Vincent. And um, his first words to me as he stepped off the, the escalator was, take me to your goddamn young genius. How much further, Matthew? You'll not call me Matthew. I'm not one of your drinking cronies carousing and wenching in the tavern. Vincent Price had always made these Edgar Allan Poe movies in the comfort of Hollywood, all in studio, uh, nicely treated and all the rest of it. And all of a sudden, he's sent off by his studio to the wilds of Norfolk, cold, misty, flat, windy and wet. And he's being told by a 23-year-old film director whom he's never heard of, to please stop overacting, rolling his eyes, and please, 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 would he be real for once? So Michael Reeves said, cut, meaning please don't move your hands about so much. Yeah, and Reeves then being in his mid-twenties, looked younger, ordering Vincent Price, yeah, a veteran who had been in like, Otto Preminger movies and Cecil B. DeMille movies around to do something, and, and Price drew himself up his forehead and says, Young man, I've been in 84 films. How many have you made? And Reeves said, two good ones. And uh, Vincent Price laughed more than anybody else. After he had won over Vincent Price, Reeves still had to deal with AIP, the film's American producers. One of their demands was for more explicit sex scenes. I said, Dad to take all my clothes off. And he said, well, it would be better. And I said, oh, God, what's my mother going to say? <laughs> said, Nobody will see a thing. It's going to be a very dark blue filter. I said, right. <laughs> so I did it. And when I saw it, I said, Mike, I said, you know, it might have been blue, dear, but it wasn't dark. <laughs> I think he said, do you realize we're making a western? We're making the old galloping across the countryside in search of the bad guy revenge western. And I think it amused him, that concept. I suspect Michael Reeve, being a, a cineast, was very familiar with the movies uh, Bud Bettiker had made in, in uh, America in the 50s with Randolph Scott. Um, something like Ride Lonesome or Comanche Station have very similar plot outlines to Witchfinder General. So I think we can, we can generally say it's one of the few English westerns. The emotion of Witchfinder comes from the landscape, comes from the rolling plains, comes from tracking shots, from the canopy of the sky, from the vastness of everything. This is um, the aesthetic that was um, defined and developed through the western, through the classic western. Sarah, I'm going to place this iron on your back. Should you faint or cry out, we can only take it that Satan has intervened to spare you your agony. When he made Witchfinder General, he wanted it to be so realistic that the people who saw the film would be enjoying, if you can use that word, the, the violence, violent aspect, the fear that was in the film, so much so that he would drive them over the top that they'd realise and feel a little bit ashamed, you know, what am I, well, why am I feeling enjoyed? And he did that um, with, the, with the ending of which find a general where uh, Ian Ogilvy beats him to death with an axe. <laughs> Fortunately, it was a rubber axe. <laughs> Mike wanted realism. He didn't, he, even if it was a rubber axe, the blows had to be hard. One of the major th themes of the day was violence in movies, and, and probably up to that time, it was one of the most violent movies seen in, in England. Ah! 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 Laura White. Ah! Ah! Elizabeth! The BBFC, which had trouble with this film, 
demanded a number of cuts, but they took it very seriously. John Trevelyan um, understood this film was a work of art, and Reeves wrote to Trevelyan an impassionate letter um, asking that they didn't ruin this film, that it was hard enough to make such a film without the film being gutted, without removing the impact, the impact which came from the, the violence in the film. Witchfinder General was a commercial and critical success, and Reeves' future seemed assured. However, the year that followed the film's release proved to be a difficult time for the young filmmaker. A series of abandoned and half-finished projects left him demoralized and despondent. By the end of that year, even his closest friends felt that he was drifting away from them. I think he got depressed uh, uh, as he got a little older. But again, we're talking about a man who it was 23. I think it was uh, something that he dealt with uh, privately. And uh, as a human being, it was, he was a delight to be around. But he was, he was bedeviled by something. And I think he felt that he was responsible suddenly for this whole crew of other people. And, and, and he wanted to push them back. He suddenly became untalkable to, or not easily sociable with. He was shut right down. And that was about, um, that was probably about three or four months before he died. Mike at the time was taking antidepressant pills and he was drinking quite heavily. And uh, according to the coroner's verdict, he came home one night, well oiled, couldn't sleep, took a handful of these pills without, you know, without even thinking about it and was dead the next morning. It's a desperate shame that, uh, that Michael's not around. Uh, I think the film industry as a whole has uh, really lost something because of it. He had this ability, as I say, to, to stick with the budget and make do. And his make doing is possibly what makes his film so interesting, is how to, how to get over a bad situation. There's a kind of trajectory. I think you see in She Beast a working through the conventions of horror cinema, going by the rule book, the look of it, the feel of it, um, jokiness, campness, gusto, things like that. In The Sorcerers, you begin to see a film that questions cinema. It is an allegorical film. It's transmitting perfectly. And the central um, image of the sorcerers, which is this ability of this old couple to live vicarious thrills through a brainwashed young man, seems to reflect cinema itself. Which Finder General is a film that goes beyond genre, a film that uses the structure of genre to really begin to build something quite unique, something different altogether. From me. You took it from me. You took it from me! You took it from me! Wherever he is, I know he's having a big laugh about it now. You know, and he's making movies, you know. <laughs> he's, God is an extra in his movie, I promise you that. <laughs>